Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the Book of Acts. It's packed full of all sorts of challenging and thought-provoking ideas. This particular lesson, which is lesson number six for August 11 of 2018, is entitled The Ministry of Peter. I thought we were talking about Paul. How did we get back to Peter? Well, let's see if we can figure out why that happened. Before we begin, of course, as usual, we'd like to ask a word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is, as always, to ask your guidance, your direction, as we dig into these very momentous words from your word. Help us to understand what, we, what you want us to learn. Help us to understand how things worked out for Peter and how they might change our lives if we, take, if we go through the same experiences as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, in the story as present, of the early church as presented by Dr. Luke, after the dramatic conversion of Saul, and Saul, so where did we leave Paul last week? Fleeing from Jerusalem, where did he go? Tarsus. Back to home, back to Tarsus, didn't he? So he's out of the picture temporarily. So what ha who, who are we going to focus on now? Peter. Talk about Peter. So what's going on back in Judea, right? Well, what did it take to convert this Galilean Jew to a Christian evangelist? Pentecost. Pentecost. Okay. Actually, the resurrection. It took, it took more than just one Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, but you're right. Well, think about why Jesus, and we don't have time to go back and look at this now, but part of the reason why Jesus chose people like Peter and John and James and so forth is because they were not educated in the rabbinical schools. They didn't have their mind just saturated with wrong ideas. Think about that. What does that say about us? Mm -hmm. mm. I think everyone here has gone to a fair amount of school. Yes. Are we the wrong people to be preaching? Well, did, did we go to any rabbinical schools? I guess that would be the question. <laughs> oh, what's the equivalent today? Mm -hmm. um, good question. That's a good question, a very I, good question. I, I believe, well, you see, after uh, the resurrection, um, well, they say, yeah, he, the tomb is empty, goes and sees it. Then they go back and go to the, the, the upper chamber. But Peter says, well, I go fishing, remember that. I just cannot give up. I've got to go fishing, you know, whatever. It's too bad, whoever we followed, you know, our earthly kingdom was not established. But I'm convinced that it took the one they were leaning on, Jesus Christ himself, suddenly he's gone. That's when this folk woke up. Yeah. It's a, well, we are on our own now. We have to take this gospel to the world. Well, anyone who t undertakes a careful reading of the New Testament will recognize that the conversion of Gentiles to become Christians probably was without doubt the most controversial issue in the apostolic church. We know that from the time of the resurrection, well, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, to the stoning of Stephen when Christians were persecuted was about three and a half years. We know that from what? The prophecies of Daniel, don't we? Uh, clearly, we know that. But when that terrible persecution happened, what happened to the Christians? Spread out. They spread, yes. Scattered. Yeah. Well, while Paul was preaching the gospel in Tarsus, about which we know almost nothing, the church in Antioch was starting to grow exponentially. Unfortunately, even that long after the death and crucifixion of Jesus, and even among the Jewish believers scattered to other areas, they still felt that it was their task to spread the gospel only to other Jews. However, a few of them, like Philip in Samaria, had moved beyond those restrictions. Now, we in our day recognize that the Samaritans at that point in time were not that much different than the Jews. 
So, he, but he moved a little ways away from his Jewish um, boundaries. Clearly, Peter was one of the leaders of the Christian group still at Jerusalem. We do not, do not know exactly how the disciples who are still dwelling in or around Jerusalem managed to avoid the persecution started by the stoning of Stephen. You would have thought that those disciples would be the first ones to be arrested and, and thrown in prison and maybe killed. Did they escape to Galilee for a period of time? We just don't know how they have managed to escape the persecution. However, Jerusalem was still considered to be the headquarters of the Christian church. God needed to take some fairly dramatic steps to get these Jewish believers to take seriously the commission to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, okay, if you had been God at that point in time, how would you convince those Jews to preach to Gentiles? That's a puzzler, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, we know that Peter had a home in Capernaum. That was in Galilee, that's not in Jerusalem. And he had a wife, because he talks about his mother-in-law. He presumably had a family there. Our story picks up with Peter itinerating or traveling around Judea. What happened to his family? Were his children grown? Did his wife travel with him? I don't see, no, we haven't know that much about him. Well, it's, it's interesting that we read considerably later, 1 Corinthians 9, 5, Paul says, Haven't I the right to follow the example of the other apostles and the Lord's brother and Peter by taking a Christian wife with me on my travels? So apparently at some point in his life, Peter was traveling with his wife. Well, what we know is that apparently at this point in time, Peter was alone. Don't they have a place up there around Capernaum? It was, it was his home or something yeah. like that? Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and it, it looks like it was his home, and then there was a, a Christian older. church built on it. And now what they have done, and because there's about three or four layers they want to, 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 to show you what they're preserved, and so they've actually built a Christian sanctuary that you can go and have services in that's on stilts up above Peter's house. So. It also seems that was the place where the Lord himself was. He yeah, Peter's absolutely. Uh, mother yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the first stories you read about is found in Acts 9, 32 to 35. Peter traveled everywhere, and on one occasion he went to visit God's people who lived in Lydda. Lydda is about 10 miles from Joppa, which is on the coast. There he met a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had not been able to get out of bed for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ makes you well. Get up and make your bed. At once Aeneas got up. All the people living in Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Does that remind you of any miracles of Je that Jesus performed? Mm, got a roof. Yes. That was on the Sabbath day or two. Yep. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and whose house was it? Whose roof got torn up? Peter's house, wasn't it? Peter's house. It was Peter's house that had the tiles torn off the roof and that man was let down. And I, you know, you, should, you shouldn't chuckle at other people's misfortunes, but when they're so totally wrong, you can't help but smile at least. And here's these Pharisees gathering around. The, the house isn't that big. So most of the people, I'm sure, that wanted to get in there were milling around outside. And who's inside? A bunch of Pharisees looking for a chance to trap Jesus. Okay, now their belief about sickness was what? It could be bad parents' fault. Yes, else is parent or yourself. Oh, yeah. It could be your fault or your parents' fault, but it was direct result of sin. sin. See, so when this guy is let down through the roof, and Jesus says, "Your sins be forgiven," Ooh, they're mine. <laughs> they said, "Okay, now we know." They didn't say this out openly. They just said it to themselves. Nobody can forgive sins except God, right? And so what did Jesus do? He says, okay, let me show you. He told the man, get up, take up your bed. And according to their thinking, now we know that sin doesn't, isn't directly on, on a global scale. Yes, yeah, sin is the cause of every sickness and death and so forth. But in an individual case, you can get sick without committing any sin. 
But in their thinking, it was a direct result of sin. And it's very likely that this young man had been to one of those, some of those Pharisees himself trying to get healed. That was what the, part of what they did. And Jesus says, okay, let me just show you. Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And according to their thinking, in order to do that, he would have to have taken care of the sin. Because how could he walk, get up and be healed and walk out with his bed unless the sins were taken care of? <laughs> it was, so did Peter heal, I mean, uh, not just heal the man, but forgive his sins? Um, I think what he said was, Jesus heals you. Would some churches in the world now want to think that Peter uh, also um, yeah. uh, forgave the sins since he was the first time? Uh, yes. The biggest cult there is. Yes. Well, this very brief account led to what came next. Many people and Lydda and Sharon became Christians. Well, what happened next? Well, no doubt this miracle was a stepping stone to what happened next. Look at Acts 9, 36 to 43. In Joppa, there was a woman named T Tabitha who was a believer. Her name in Greek is Dorcas, meaning a deer. She spent all her time doing good and helping the poor. At that time, she became ill and died. Her body was washed and laid in a room upstairs. Joppa was not very far from Lydda, and when the believers in Joppa heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him with the message, Please, hurry and come to us. So Peter got ready and went with them. When he arrived, he was taken to the room upstairs where all the widows crowded around him crying and showing him all the shirts and clothes that Dorcas had made while she was alive. Peter put them all out of the room, knelt down and prayed, then he turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Peter reached over and helped her get up. Then he called all the believers, including the widows, and presented her alive to them. The news about this spread all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed on in Joppa for many days with a tanner of leather named Simon. Okay, so what's happening here? What's, what's God doing behind the scenes here? Trying to shake up people's paradigms. <laughs> Trying to shake up people, okay, that's a good way to start. Kind of like, like a Kickstarter program. Mm -hmm. I would just uh, imagine. How long has she been dead? At least of... Two or three days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of people in Joppa became, con became converted, but Peter wanted to stay there and follow up in the ministry, right? I mean, you, you do something like this, you can't just run away. You've got to stay there. Well, who are you going to stay with? Someone who deals with dead animals. Yeah. Oh, dear. Touch dead things. Ceremonially unclean. Yeah. Ceremonial unclean, ceremonially unclean every day of his life. Perpetually. <laughs> yeah, perpetually. And yet, Peter's staying with him. I mean, that must have caused some uncleanness in Peter, right? Well, is, is, God, is God trying to just sort of broaden Peter's perspective a little bit here? Those pharisaical rules that they hold on to so tightly, Peter, you probably don't need to be quite so strict with all those rules. Is that what God's trying to say here? Well, it took Peter a little bit, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened next in the story? Cornelius comes in. Yeah. yeah. The story of Cornelius. One shock, another shock, and another yeah. shock. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, here's two incredible miracles that have happened within a few miles of each other and the news is spreading around the community, and Peter is taking advantage of it. He's preaching, pre preaching, he's saying, you need to believe in this Jesus. I mean, look at the name is Jesus is responsible for these miracles that you've seen happen. 
So let's 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 be honest. I'm I'm going to use it. We we live in a community that probably has the highest density of hospital beds per population in any place in the world, here in Loma Linda. Huge hospital. They're just building one that's two or three times as big right now. Do we need a hospital in the blue zone? <laughs> well, unfor well, fortunately, I guess we re we take care of a lot of people that live outside the blue zone. But I want you to just imagine, I want you th out there to think for with me for a moment. Suppose that Jesus showed up one day, walked through Loma Linda University Health, and healed every single person in that hospital. Sent them home. Well, we thought we had parking problems now. <laughs> <laughs> the accountants would have a stroke. The accountants would have a stroke, okay. The, what, the first question I would ask, what would the news media say? Yeah. Either nothing or they would... Yeah. No telling me. How could you not say, somehow. you'd have to say something. Oh, there are rumors <laughs> that are there. There are rumors. Rumors, is that Loma Linda? But they would have to interview some of the people who have been seriously, I mean, on the brink of death. I mean, there's people on the brink of death here every day, all the time. I don't think we would need the news media. All we need is one of those people that was healed go, to go home on the other side of the freeway yeah. and it would be all over Southern California. They yeah. put it on Facebook and Instagram and whatever. And what then would the popular media say? I mean there's no doubt about the fact that in our popular media we have a strong bias against Christianity. Yeah. What would they say? Oh, but they have covered things happening here in this institution in the past in a very, very positive way. Yeah. Time well, and again. so long as nobody works, performs any miracles, it's okay. <laughs> that might... <laughs> that's different. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's different, yeah. That's okay. what say. Well, <laughs> is, is, is miracle a thing of the past? No. no. Are there going to be miracles just before Jesus comes again? Yes, however, there's going to be pseudo-miracles. There's going to be those too. And it's happening right now. It, those are already starting to happen. Yes. I mean, look at, look at the programs on TV on Sunday morning, the, the evangelistic premises and things that are going on there. And when money is involved, there has to be big doubt. Yeah. So if God started performing miracles, do you think the devil would try to duplicate? Absolutely, yes. Well, Jesus had some interesting words to say about miracles being a, a basis for evidence. I think you have something on that, Carrie. Yes. Why do we not see many miracles in our day? We have clear scriptural evidence of the fact that miracles will be performed as we approach the second coming of Jesus Christ. But Ellen White warned us that the performance of miracles is not God's way of working right now because the devil would try to duplicate them and people would become even more confused. However, that is what will happen at the very end of time. In John 20, verses 24 to 29, one of the twelve disciples, Thomas called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, Unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were together again indoors, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands and stretch out your hands. Put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. I want to interrupt there for just a second. Do you think Thomas did? In the end, I think he did. But well, look what it says next. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. He doesn't say anything about the scars. He doesn't say anything about the si thing on his side. There was all he just took one look and he heard the voice of Jesus and he knew. You. Jesus said to him, Do you believe because you see me? How happy are those who believe without seeing me? And that's from the Good News Bible. Mm. 
what does that imply about us in our situation? What if we demanded a miracle before we believed? That we could see ourselves, I want to put my finger in it. On, on the other hand, God doesn't want us to believe anything without evidence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Absolutely. We'll, we've mentioned that many times before, and we'll talk about it again in a little bit. Well, what kind of things happen on those major TV programs that we sometimes watch on Sunday mornings? Yeah. Heal! Yes. Fall backwards. Fall backwards, etc. I had the privilege a few years ago of traveling to Lourdes in France. It's unbelievable. I mean, you know a lot more about it than I do, I'm sure, Fred. But people lined up by the hundreds and thousands traveling and you, 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 you have to get in line, you, you have to pay to get in line, and you, they, you, they, you go past a place where there's candles of various sizes. And, and if you're really convinced about the truth, you can buy a great big candle as almost as big as you are, and you go through and you look up and you see this place on the hill where supposedly this young woman had the vision of, of Mary and so forth like this, and, and you're supposed to be healed. Well, we saw the wheelchairs and the stretchers and so forth coming out the other side just the same as they were going on on this side. We watched for a while. Well, healing the sick is such a great way to get people's attention and attract them to the gospel, so why don't we do that in our day? Wouldn't that be a good thing? Sure, it would be a good thing, but at that time it was more important to prove to the world and to the Jews in particular that indeed Jesus was resurrected. And this was one of the best ways to do it, to heal in the name of Jesus, that everyone might know, yes, he is indeed resurrected, as we have announced it previously. And this opens a person's mind to the possibility, okay, maybe I should listen to this word. Because miracles, to me, are the signature of God on his message. What's important is not the miracle, it's the message. Yeah. And Jesus always, when he performed a miracle, there was something that went with it, a message that went with that's it. That's it. And, and that's, that's exactly what you... Now, I think, Fred, you've got something to talk to us about evidence there. Yeah, in um, Steps to Christ by Ellen White, page 105, God, ne God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to ba base our faith. But no miracles? That's right, evidence of some mm. sort. Mm. Uh, his existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeal to our reason. Mm -hmm. And this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have an opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. Wow. So Do you want to comment on that one line, rest upon evidence, not demonstration? Well, demonstration, when she contrasts evidence and demonstration, she, she must be talking about compelling demonstration. In other words, so overwhelming that, I mean, we know, Philippians 2, that at the very end, at the third coming, even the devil is going to be down on his knees saying, God, you did it right. But does that make him into a Christian? Obviously not. Or, or all the sinners are on, on his side. It doesn't. So, Compelling evidence. It's talk, we're talking about compelling evidence. That just, you, can't, you, know, you, you can't find any way around it. Well, let's face it. A miracle cannot change our heart. We might witness it. That doesn't change our heart into a more pure or loving heart. So it takes a message to do that. Would we say that compelling is d like coercion, yes. extortion, and so forth, God, which God does not operate that way. No, right. But it's evidence. And if you think about it, n none of us have seen God. Or I can't think of anybody here. And he keeps himself in the, and he permits and uses, permits other people to carry his message. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how almost several layers, this, how, how several years, thousands of years old that, that he communicates. 
But it's if if to the extent that it is truth, that's all he has to could use. It's the message. Yeah. For well, sure. so now we we're following our story about Peter, and next we come to the story of Cornelius. Now, we don't have time to read the whole story. It's found in Acts 10. The 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 initial thing is found in Acts 10, verses 1 to 48. Let's just review what happened. Peter is hungry. He goes up on the roof, and what does he do? He goes to sleep. And he sees a vision. And what's down, what, what, what does he see in his vision? Some kind of curtain, some kind of drape. Mm -hmm. and with figures on. With animals. Yeah. yeah. Animals coming down in this sheet or curtain or whatever it is. And what kind of animals were they? <clears throat> Unclean. Unclean animals, a whole variety of unclean animals. Reptiles and even, wild birds. Yeah, so even reptiles. Yeah. yeah. And God says, God says, arise, Peter, and eat. <laughs> now, Peter said, if God has said it, I believe it, and that's all there is to it, right? Mm. No. No. <laughs> no, I've never done this in my life. <laughs> I've never eaten these kind of things. It can't, it can't be you, God. I, and this is a very important point in our passing here. Let me just mention it. There are two ways to look at truth and understand about truth. <clears throat> One way is to say those in authority must understand the truth. So if they come up with something new that's different than what we knew in the past, well, throw out the old and we'll just accept the new. But God never works that way. He says, if I bring you some new truth, it may be new truth, it may be something new to you, but it is never inconsistent with what I've said in the past. So Peter is here saying, God, I hear you, but we got some, we got some history here, right? You, 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 this isn't what you told us to do in the past. And so what happened? This, the sheet goes back up on the heavens, and Peter takes a few deep breaths, and whoosh, here comes the sheet, the sheet down again. Rise and eat, Peter. No, I, I can't. Up it goes again. Pretty soon it's back again. And I don't know. I think after about that, about the third time God told me to do something like that, I'd be saying, are you, are what you am sure? I missing? Are you, are you Fortunately, sure? when you read on, you understand. Uh huh. Well, it was very clear that this vision was not about what kind of food was safe or good to eat. But for most Christians around yeah. the world, around the world, this passage, hey, we can eat everything that comes yeah. along our way. That's because they haven't read the rest of the story. Don't need to anymore. <laughs> God said it, I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way they look at it. <clears throat> well, it was about, Peter was trying to, God was trying to say something to, about Peter, to Peter about what? Well, let me read verse 17 of yes, chapter 10. Yes, please do. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, the men sent by Cornelius had learned where Simon's house was, and they were now standing in front of the gate. That's, and just a couple lines later, he says, I, uh, no, verse uh, 28, but God has shown me that I must not consider any person ritually unclean or defiled. And all of this is in the, the, the interaction with these people. So how did God show this? Mm -hmm. By the vision, mm -hmm. just before the people arrived, just before these yeah. unclean people well, arrived. It's a, it's a long day's Perfect. journey from, from Caesarea to Joppa, if you're walking. And it's a long day's journey back. And what's Peter doing? Who's he walking with? It's very important to notice two groups of people he's walking with. Who are the two groups of people? Well, Peter was at the house. Well, I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about getting to the house. This is a part of the story that we, we, have to, we have to read between the lines. I'm reading between the lines. Who is Peter? He's walking now from Joppa back to Caesarea. Who's with him? I don't remember. Cornelius. Well, of course, the people that... Cornelius sent, right? And what kind of people would they be? Unbelievable. Well, they, they would be. But, but not Peter was at, 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 at the house. 
No, he was in Joppa, and he, and he had to walk to Caesarea, <laughs> where Cornelius was. It's a day's journey up along the coast. Okay, okay, after the vision, yes. Yeah, after he's the walking. vision. He's walk yeah, he's walking welcomes the guys Cornelius. into the house. He yes. says, have something to eat. Yes. Now here, is, here he is already in this polluted house of a, of a tanner, so come on in. <laughs> we'll eat with you. And then the next day, that night and the next day, he's walking. But who else is there? Six witnesses. Six of the believers from Joppa went with him. Why did he take them along? To be absolutely sure, you need seven, I mean, seven people testifying of the same thing. Yeah, it, it, that's the maximum number of witnesses you could require in a Jewish court, seven. So Peter says, if God wants me to do this, I'm, I'm taking all the, all the evidence I need with me. So here's these seven believers walking with at least three people who have been sent by Cornelius. What do you suppose their conversation was like? It stilted at the beginning, probably. Well... Let's go back, way back in history for a moment, and look at Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. We're talking about spreading the gospel to the Gentiles, right? The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your relatives, and your father's home, and go to a land that I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations. What was God's plan? That must the be a typo. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that was I, at the I beginning. Will bless That's the before Jewish those nation. Nations. Isn't that what it meant? <laughs> well, why were the Jewish people given the land of Palestine? Crossroads of the world. It was a crossroads of the world between Egypt, one great civilization, and Mesopotamia on the other end. You had to travel through Palestine. Well, but he wanted all along a peculiar people. Build a wall. I want the clear distinction between you and the people that you are going to witness to. Yeah, and but that's the important point. You are anymore. going, you are going to witness to. Yes. As anyone who has carefully read the New Testament, the Jews, it knows the G the Jews considered the fact that they were the circumcised as setting them apart from the Gentiles who were the uncircumcised and thus unclean. Hellenistic Christian believers were already starting to recognize that the gospel needs to go to Gentiles. For example, look at Paul's statements, and this, of course, comes later in places like Titus 2.11 and Galatians 3.26-28, Ephesians 2, and so forth. But uh, we have a couple of those passages here. Charles? Titus 2.11, For God has revealed His grace for the salvation of the whole human race. Wow. The Bible. Yes, wow. Galatians 3.26-29. It is through faith that all of you are God's children in union with Christ Jesus. You were you are baptized into the union with Christ, and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. So there is no dis difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and the free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are also descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Wow. That sounds like a good Pharisee talking, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no difference between you Jews and Gentiles. That's exactly what the Pharisees thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what further steps did God take to make sure the message was clear? Look, look at Acts 10, 44 to 48. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who were listening to his message. The Jewish believers who had come from Joppa with Peter, there's part of the evidence, and we'll get over to chapter 11, it mentions specifically there were six of them, were amazed that God had poured out his gift of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles also. 
for they heard them speaking in strange tongues and praising God's greatness. Peter spoke up, These people have received the Holy Spirit just as we also did. Can anyone then stop them from being baptized with water? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay with them for a few days. Now we've gone all the way. We're over there partying with the Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. Staying overnight. One thing, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit before they were baptized in water. Yes. That is amazing. Well, one of the points that I, I like to ask questions about is, the disciples were specifically told, and we have a passage about that. Maybe we should just look at, look at that. Gordon, let's read that first, and then we'll ask my question. From Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 39. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. During the dispersion of the Jews, during the dispersion, the Jews had been scattered to almost every part of the inhabited world. And in their exile, they had learned to speak various languages. Many of these Jews were on this occasion in Jerusalem, and this is talking about the Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost, attending the religious festivals then in progress. Every known tongue was represented by those assembled. This diversity of languages would have been a great hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel. God, therefore, in, his, in a miraculous manner, supplied the deficiency of the apostles. The Holy Spirit did for them that which they could not have accomplished for themselves in a lifetime. They could now proclaim the truth of the gospel abroad, speaking with accuracy the languages of those for whom they were laboring. This miraculous gift was a strong evidence to the world that their commission bore the signet of heaven. From this time forth, the language of the disciples was pure, simple, and accurate, whether they spoke in their native tongue or in a foreign language. Wow. Pure, pure and simple message. Yeah, Acts of the Apostles 39 and 40. Accurate. So, the question is, if that same kind of ability is poured out on Cornelius and his family, did they become witnesses? We don't they, have record of it, do we? No, we don't know. We know about that, but Presumably. we know that these people were, who were like in a position like Cornelius rotated out to these areas, and then they were taken back to Rome. Many of them. Could they have been evangelists at Rome? Well, what do you think happened when Peter went back to Jerusalem? They were mad at him. The apostles and the other believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. When Peter went to Jerusalem, those who were in favor of circumcising Gentiles criticized him, saying, You were a guest in the home of uncircumcised Gentiles, and you even ate with them? So Peter gave them a complete account of what had happened from the very beginning. While I was praying in the city of Joppa, I had a vision. I saw something coming down that looked like a large sheet being lowered by its four corners from heaven, and it stopped next to me. I looked closely inside and saw domesticated and wild animals, reptiles, and wild birds. Then I heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Certainly not, Lord. No ritually unclean or defiled food has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke again with, from heaven, Do not consider anything unclean that God has declared clean. This happened three times, and finally the whole thing was drawn back up into heaven. At that very moment, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to go with them without hesitation. These six fellow believers, these six fellow believers standing beside me here, from Joppa accompanied me to Caesarea, and we all went into the house of Cornelius. He told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send someone to Joppa for a man whose full name is Simon Peter. He will speak words to you by which you and all your family will be saved. And when I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them just as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is clear that God gave those Gentiles the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was, I, 
Who was I then to try to stop God? How could you meet an argument like that? When they heard this, they stopped their criticism and praised God, saying, Then God has given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and live. And that was the end of the opposition to preaching to gospel, the gospel to the Gentiles, right? Wrong. <laughs> Wrong! But that's a tremendous paradigm shift. Well, despite the seven witnesses, <laughs> it was still wrong. <laughs> wow. Okay, I think, Myra, do we have yes. you, Acts 11, 19? This is what comes next. Yes, Acts 11, 19 to 21. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution, which took place when Stephen was killed, went as far as Phoenicia, Phoenicia, Phoenicia. Phoenicia Cyprus, and Antioch telling the message to Jews only. But other believers who were in Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to the Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. I have to, just have to mention a little bit of geography here. Where is Cyrene located? Northern Africa. Okay, in what is Libya. now the country of Libya. Mm -hmm. So Christian missionaries went from Libya, hotbed of Islam today, to Syria, another hotbed of Islam, and were the first ones to openly spread the gospel to Gentiles. Wow. Dr. Luke himself, a Greek Gentile, did something interesting in Acts 11. He moved from this story about Peter and Cornelius recounting Jewish prejudice directly to the story of what was happening in Antioch where Hellenistic Christian believers from Cyprus and Libya or Cyrene had gone to Antioch and began <laughs> to openly preach the gospel to Gentiles. We do not even know the names of those first Christian missionaries to Gentiles. Jim? The time had come for an entirely new phase of work to be entered upon by the Church of Christ. The doors, excuse me, the door that may, excuse me, the door that many of the Jewish converts had closed against the Gentiles was now to be thrown open, and the Gentiles who accepted the gospel were to be regarded as on an equality with the Jewish disciples without the necessity of observing the rite of circumcision. It is Acts of the Apostles, page 136. Oh boy, so now we've got a big controversy. St brewing, right? Well, we know that the church at Antioch became a great center for the Christian message. It was the home church for Whoa. Paul, Barnabas, Silas later who worked with Paul. It was, you know. And that church did what with Paul and Barnabas? They anointed them to go and carry the gospel. And they, when they sent them out, what was Paul's plan? He always went to the synagogues first. Why did he do that? All well, people would be gathering together on Sabbath, so he had an yeah. audience. Yeah. And, but, and uh, if he had first gone to the Gentiles, the Jews would have rejected him. Exactly. In that Without even hearing him. So he went to the Jews first, and when the Jews rejected him, he said, okay, then I will go to the Gentiles. Well, we must remember that there were many Gentiles who had already been converted to Judaism, and this opened the door to more Gentiles, as a matter of yeah. fact. Yeah. Well, we know from Acts 11, verse 26, that it was in Antioch that the Christians were first called, well, the believers were first called Christians. Why do you think that was? It's a derogatory term. Derogatory? Followers what? of that dead man. Yeah. You mean your religion is based on following a man who probably is dead and was killed as a traitor to the Roman government? Well, that's a great God you worship. Well, early in the book of Acts, we find believers referred to as brethren. In fact, what did, what did um, Ananias say to Paul? Brother Paul. You came here to kill me, but I'm calling you brother. 
That's Acts, one example of that is Acts 1, verse 16. They were called disciples, Acts 6, 1. They were called, even called saints in Acts 9, 13. But it was in Antioch that they were first called Christians, and we've already mentioned that it was derogatory to start out with. So what does it mean to you today to be called a Christian? Do you hide your Christianity? Do you actually live a life that is different in some distinct ways because you are a Christian? If you were put on trial for being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Are Christians and Christian standards being respected in our world today? No. Societies in the so-called Western or developed world are racing to rid themselves of Christian standards in every way possible. The communist world has done everything possible for years to eliminate Christian ideas, beliefs, and standards. And authorities in Muslim and even Hindu areas are persecuting Christians every day. Well, and I'm, well, I guess we probably have time. Acts 12, 1 to 18. More persecution. What happened next? Well, maybe we better rush through it here. Uh, Peter was arrested back in Jerusalem. And what was, well, I guess we should back up before that. King Herod, this was the grandson of Herod the Great, decided he wanted to endear himself to the Sanhedrin and to the Pharisees particularly. And what did he do, first of all? Persecuted Christians. He arrested James and had his head cut off. Why do you suppose God allowed that? He became the first Christian martyr. Well then, since he got a positive response from that, Herod arrested Peter. Peter was kept in prison until the Feast of the Unleavened Bread was over. Now, of course, these times, three times in the year, Jews were encouraged to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. This was one of those times. And there were enormous crowds. And so what do you think Herod's trying to do here? He's trying to ingratiate himself to the Jewish population. He says, I'm going to arrest this Christian and I'm going to make a big... Now, we can't do it during the festival. Everybody would go in shock if we tried to do something like that during the festival. But as soon as the festival's over, we're going to deal with this Peter and boy, I'm going to, my popularity is going to soar, right? Well, as you can imagine, the Christians in and around Jerusalem were praying earnestly for Peter's release. So what happened? Look at verses 6, uh, Acts 12, 6 to 19. The night before Herod was going to bring him out to the people, Peter was sleeping between two guards. He was tied with two chains, and there were guards on duty at the prison gate. Suddenly an angel of the Lord stood there, and a light shone in the cell. The angel shook Peter by the shoulder, woke him up, and said, Hurry, get up. At once the chains fell off Peter's hands. Then the angel said, Fasten your belt and put on your sandals. Peter did so, and the angel said, Put your cloak round you and come with me. Peter followed him out of the prison, not knowing, however, if what the angel was doing was real, he thought he was seeing a vision. Now that tells us something important about visions. What does it tell us about visions? They can be pretty real. <laughs> they are very real. If you're in a vision, you don't know for sure. I mean, you're there. They passed by the first guard post, and then the second, and came at last to the iron gate leading into the city. The gate opened for them to, uh, by itself, first automatic door, mm -hmm. and they went out. <laughs> they walked down the street, and suddenly the angel left Peter. Then Peter realized what had happened to him and said, Now I know that it is really true. The Lord sent his angel to rescue me from Herod's power and from everything the Jewish people expected to happen. Aware of the situation, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. And what do we call that? The upper room. The upper room. Yep. Peter knocked at the outside door and a servant named Rhoda came to answer it. She recognized Peter's voice and was so happy that she ran back in without opening the door and announced that Peter was standing outside. You're mad, you told, they told her. But she insisted that it was true. So they answered, it is his angel. This is one of our key verses for saying that people have guardian angels. Meanwhile, Peter kept on knocking and are probably more insistent all the time. At last, they opened the door, and when they saw him, they were amazed. 
He motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and explain to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell this to James and the rest of, in which James is this now? Stepbrother of Jesus. Stepbrother of Jesus. Tell this to James and the rest of the believers, he said. Then he left and went somewhere else. When morning came, there was a tremendous confusion among the guards. What had happened to Peter? Herod gave orders to search for him, but they could not find him. So he had the guards questioned and ordered them to be put to death. After this, Herod left Judea and spent some time in Caesarea. And without taking more time, because we're running out of time, what happened to King Herod? He went up to Sidon and made such a, a display, been, dressed in very fancy clothes and so forth, and he made a speech, and all the people were worshiping as a god, him as a god, and what happened? God. He was struck down. Yes. And in a short time, he was dead. Worms ate him. Mm-hmm. Well, from what we know, uh, he, he ruled Judea, this Herod Agrippa, ruled Judea from AD 40 to 44, about four years, four or five years. And what we know about, from what we know about him, this story fits in perfectly. No doubt Agrippa already knew that Peter had been freed from prison earlier, Acts 5. That is probably why he took such extreme precautions to make sure that Peter did not escape from his custody. This precaution by Agrippa served only to demonstrate, once again, the superiority of God's abilities in caring for those who are his faithful followers. The release of Peter from prison led to great rejoicing among the Christians in Jerusalem. But Peter needed to leave that area immediately to prevent being rearrested. In the book of Acts, Dr. Luth, Luke followed that story with an account of what happened to Herod Agrippa shortly thereafter. We've mentioned that already. So what have we learned from these brief accounts about the work of Peter in Judea? Myra, I think it's your turn. No, I think it's your turn. Yeah, it's a my story. In the 10th chapter of Acts, we have still another instance of the ministration of heavenly angels, resulting in the conversion of Cornelius and his company. Let these chapters, that's Acts 8 through 11, be read and receive special attention. In them we see that heaven is much nearer to the Christian who is engaged in the work of soul saving than many suppose. We should learn through them also the lesson of God's regard for every human being, and that each should treat his fellow man as one of the Lord's instrumentalities for the accomplishment of his work on the earth. Ellen White, SDA Bible Commentary, quoted in our, uh, that's volume 6, page 1059, and quoted on our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide for Friday, August 10. Well, do we have any uh, cultural, social, political, or linguistic barriers that lead to tensions between groups and prevent us from freely spreading the gospel today? That couldn't happen to us, right? We're enlightened and we're very loving and so well. what? Everybody gets along so well. Yeah. Depends so on what side of the world you're looking at. <laughs> so is having black churches and Filipino churches and Korean churches and so on, is that a cultural prejudice or what? Hmm. Well, would that not be what we call Christian often? It's the hearts of every believer. Didn't we all grow up singing Kumbaya, my Lord, Kumbaya? Yeah, yeah. yeah wouldn't that be nice? Well, what, do we, what, do we, what sticks out in your mind about the story of Peter back in the days when he was still with Jesus? He was rash. clearly outspoke. Uh, yeah, he was rash. He was outspoken. He was the one who's first, often the first one to speak up when Jesus would ask a question. We think it was about Matthew 16. Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Did any of the disciples have any idea the implications of what he said on that occasion? Very, very unlikely. But he was, commended, he was commended by Jesus for those words, but Jesus correctly recognized that Peter was not the rock foundation, or in the Greek, the Petra, that would be the foundation of the Christian church, but rather he would be only a small stone of Petras. It is important to recognize after reading Acts, 40, uh, Acts 16, verse 19, that it was not just Peter who was given the keys to the kingdom, it was all of the apostles. Let me read that to you. Matthew 18, verse 18. 
And so I tell all of you, what you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And that's because they were given the keys, right? They have the ability to do that. John 20, 23 says essentially the same thing. So, uh, when the Lord told Peter, Peter, you're the Petros, you're the little, I am the rock. But it's misinterpreted by yeah. so many churches as if Peter is the rock, he is the big boss. But Christ did not say that. Think about another one of Peter's experience when they came in the co when Jesus came across the water at night and they were all scared to death and Jesus says, don't worry, it's me. Peter says, well, can I come to you? Yeah, come on out. And he did just fine so long as he had his eyes on Jesus. And then what? He looked back at me. <laughs> and he started to sink. It was only Jesus reaching out to him that kept him from drowning. Well, in the upper room, he swore with an oath that he would go with Jesus even to death. And what do we know? A few hours later, he was cursing and swearing that he had, didn't even know this man. Well, then there was a walk beside the Sea of Galilee that came after the resurrection. And God told him, Jesus told him what was going to happen. So how do you feel about Peter's ministry that we've studied today? Do you wish we could have some evangelists among Adventist organizations that could heal people and maybe even raise people from the dead? Might that happen in our future? Possible. Of course, we must remember that these miracles were not done by Peter. They were done by God working alongside Peter. Could we have that same working relationship with God today? Are there Corneliuses in our world today who are reaching out to find something that they perhaps do not even recognize exists but are hoping for someone to help them discover the gospel. Could some of them live in your area? Perhaps even be people that you know. Are you prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the truths that you believe? Peter said that we should be. Remember 1 Peter 3.15? So how do you feel about this whole story here? What do you think we should learn from the story of Cornelius? Are we open to people of other cultures and other languages, people who may, whose skin color may be different than ours? Well, by the time Paul's ministry got into full swing, there could be no question about the fact that the gospel was intended for everybody, and that means even today. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these clear and convincing messages, this evidence that we see, not only from you, but from your immediate followers. Here we have in this book, this single book that, we, that tells us about the early history of the Christian church. We are so dependent upon it as to know what happened. We see evidence of something of what we call the early reign. We hope it'll be a, for, a foretaste of the latter reign, which we hope will come again very soon. May we be a part of it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.